Well, hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Nice, so nice, to again. nice to see everybody. How's everybody doing? Excellent. Good. Good. Is anybody nice Friday? Yes. Yeah. Anybody snowed in today? No, nope. I'm, I'm nope. actually I'm actually in Burlington today. I know I my see first that. Day, yeah, my first day back at the office in over a year. Oh, wow! That's crazy. Mm -hmm. One full year. Feels nice. Yes, I broke my leg last October. Right. Thanks to the weekend. I was in bed until like February. Went to PDC in March. Remember, you guys were wheeling me in the wheelchair because I yep. had. To I had four presentations and then when we came home I went to the office for like a half an hour and then I came out with a fever and coughing and everybody was like get out and that's when everybody ended up staying home because of COVID so I haven't been here since last October. That's crazy. Oh, feels good that to be nice. back. Oh I bet. Mm -hmm. I bet. Well we are everyone is kind of streaming through right now we're just about we're just about to 12 o'clock. So I'm going to just kind of give a bit of housekeeping and then I'll launch right into introducing our guest for today. So we are here together for about an hour. So if there's any questions, um, if you wanna use the Q&A function on the bottom there, um, if we have a chance to get to that today, we will. Um, if there's anything that you wanna ask uh, Dr. Hassanpour, uh, Siavash, then put it in the Q&A. If we don't have time to get to it today, I can send him a record of those questions. So with that, I'm gonna just launch in here and welcome everyone. We are very excited to have you join us here for the RDH View. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Crest and Oral-B for being the sponsors today and making this event possible. And I wanna introduce you all to our guest, Dr. Siavash Hassanpour, um, periodontist, and owner of the North York, North York Periodontal Center for Periodontics and Implant Surgery. So thank you very, very much for being here with us today. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited. This is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. And I know that you don't like this part, but I am going to <laughs> introduce you and just tell everyone a little bit about you. So you can okay. just turn the sound off if you don't want to hear it, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, just a little bit of background, I had the pleasure of working with Sia Vash at, at a periodontal office in Burlington. And I must say that during my time in periodontics, um, for all of my years in clinical practice, I think my time in periodontics was probably the most empowering experience for me. Um, I also never really felt quite, I mean, my, my efforts were always appreciated, but not as much as they were when I was in perio. It was that the collaboration between periodontists and dental hygienists is something that I am very, very passionate about. And it was my experience in Burlington with Sia Vash and uh, Dr. Thang that kind of brought that about. So I am very, very excited about today for that reason. Um, Dr. Hassanpour, and he prefers Sia Vash, so we'll go by Sia Vash today. He completed his dental training at the University of Toronto. He received his bachelor's degree in molecular biology in 2008 and completed his first master's of science degree in bone biology in 2010. He obtained his doctor of dental surgery degree in 2014. And finally, he completed his second master's of science degree in innate immunology in 2017. He also completed his extensive training in uh, periodontology and implantology in 2017. He is a board certified periodontist and a fellow of the Royal College of Dentists of Canada. He has published multiple peer reviewed articles and is a winner of multiple scientific research and clinical awards. He teaches at the University of Toronto and in his spare time, you may see him teaching several um, lectures for dental hygienists and dentists across Ontario. So thank you for finding time to be with us today. I am really, really quite honored and thrilled to have you join us. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. <laughs> and uh, no, it's great. I love I love uh, lecturing. I love talking and, uh, and especially to hygienists. I find them they're the, by far the most receptive audience. And so uh, I really look forward to this platform and this uh, and the, the panel discussion today. Perfect. Well, thank you. And I've probably made it quite clear that um, 
that I love the interprofessional collaboration between hygienists and uh, and periodontists. But from your standpoint, Sia Bash, mm. how do you see yourself partnering with us as dental hygienists? Yeah, I mean, you know, you said it, uh, the collaboration between periodontists and hygienists is very, very unique. Um, and I think it's something that every dentist uh, in the community should to, to try to build that relationship. Um, personally, I work very, very closely with the hygienists in my practice. Uh, every single patient that, of mine that I see, uh, my hygienists know the patient very, very well as well. And, um, you know, I empower my hygienists to help me be a part of their treatment team. So, you know, for instance, every single patient that comes in gets a full mouth charting every appointment with the hygienist and any treatment plan that I come up with, the hygienists know what I'm doing, uh, why I'm doing it, and then they help reinforce that to the patient. So the, really the hygienist and, the, and, and myself um, really become one. And so that's a really important collaboration that I try to uh, have in my office. And then anytime I give a lecture to, to hygienists and or dentists, I try to sort of reinforce that team approach um, so that it's sort of like a unified front so that the patient doesn't really feel like, oh, I'm seeing the hygienist or I'm seeing the dentist or the periodontist. They just feel like I'm seeing my team. And so I think that's really important. Um, yeah. For, yeah. And I and I witnessed one of, your, one of your techniques. I don't know if you know it's a technique or not, but when you'd come into the, the um, operatory for yeah. our mutual client you'd often say well like Beth do you see this like, what do you think about this and it wasn't a test it was you yeah. were really trying to kind of bring me in as um, as a partner in trying to help that client reach optimal oral health which was just so fantastic so yeah, yeah I mean it really I, helps I think when the patient see, feels like uh, that everybody that they're seeing is involved in their care it just brings a level of comfort and 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 it really just reinforces i think that's the word right it just really reinforces the patient's uh, oral health for them right so i think yeah that's great and i didn't know that was a technique i was doing i was just trying to i was just trying to interact <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I it was great and then i mean you didn't always see the after effect of that but then right. you would leave the room and right. i just felt like the respect that then i had from our mutual right. client was heightened because they saw me right. as a very integral part of of the process and um, it, the collaboration within that practice was just, it was, yeah. it was perfect. It also, it also would add such importance to what you're talking about because if it's important enough that maybe Beth had spoke to the client about that before and you came in, then the patients then are sitting there going, wait a minute, I do have to listen to what they're saying. They're taking time to physically discuss this, to come up with a plan and that they really are ultimately helping ourselves out. So I have a question for you. When I'm trying to refer my clients to you, what's the best way I can expand or give them information on what to expect when they come as a new patient to your practice? Yeah, um, great question. I think uh, it's really good when the patients know why they're being referred, um, and then also what to expect when they are when they when they come to our office. So, you know, one of the one of the more challenging things that I sometimes have to face is when the patient comes in, and the first thing I ask him is, you know, Mrs. Jones, what brings you in to see me today? And they said, Oh, I don't, I don't know. They just told me I need to see a periodontist, which is fine. I mean, that's okay. We deal with that all the time, but it, it's, uh, it's difficult to sort of, now I have to convince the patient that they need to see me and then tell them what's wrong. Whereas if they say, oh, you know what? Actually, my hygienist has been following this recession defect on you know, the upper left, upper left canine and it's getting worse. So now they told me I need a soft tissue graph. Wow. I'm like, thank you, you know, Carrie, you, you just made my life so easy. So I think... So for, in terms of the, the, the referral process, I think it's great if you can empower the patient, let them know you need to see the person. For, it's not just a periodontist, the endodontist, the orthodontist, whatever. You need to see so-and-so because of, and then in terms of what they can expect, typically when we see our patients, we do, uh, we do like an, the, the full workup, right? The, the medical dental history, social history, family history, dental history, all that. And then we also do um, photographs. We take clinical photos. We take uh, radiographs, diagnostic radiographs. Um, and what I mean by that is that everybody thinks that when you go to the periodontist, they're going to take a full mouth series. And that's definitely not the case, right? We take diagnostic radiographs, whatever we feel like is necessary. And if we have recent radiographs from the dentist or the hygienist, and that's all we need, we don't always take radiographs. And we do an examination, whether it's a localized examination or general examination as per the patient or the referrals um, request. 
So it would be helpful when we refer you to give you to make sure that we try to forward any radiographs or clinical history we have and to give you and the client, let's say, a little report saying, please go and have this area evaluated. It doesn't mean that you're not going to put on your blinders and not look in the, anywhere else, but particularly that there's a, a zone or some information to transfer, because that, I think, would help the clients feel more comfortable coming to see you too, because, oh, Carrie told me, or your doctor so-and-so told me that there was this concern. Let me take a look at that and I'll communicate yeah. with them. I think it really helps that collaboration. Yeah. Um, and one of, the things, yeah. Like one of the things, like while, while you're talking about that, I was thinking a lot of times we'll say something to our clients and, and our patients, and then they don't understand. So they'll mm -hmm. come to you and they'll be like, I don't know why I'm here, but this is where I'm so, I'm, I'm so keen on, um, those those visual pads and you can get them from from Crescent or OB when you're with the oral health um, essentials program and it shows the whole odontogram so here's here are here's your problems um, this is a treatment that we recommend and that way they're leaving with this with this pad of or of this paper to show them these are the areas so and it's not like you're going to refer them right away. Like this has been happening for a while. So the more you focus on and you write it down, you tell them what they need to do at home, what, what kind of tools that they need to use at home, where their problem areas are, then it's starting to sink in with them, right? So then it's not just a big surprise that I have to go to the periodontist and I, I don't know why I'm here, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So when, when would it like be a good time for somebody to refer to you? Like mm -hmm. how... What do you, what do you recommend? Yeah, that's a great question again. And I, I get it all the time. So for me, there's a couple of, there's a couple of rules of thumb that, that it, I, I, I always say it's a good time to refer. Number one is um, it's for those odd cases where two plus two doesn't equal to four, right? I had an oral pathologist, Dr. Yona Lee Young, and she always said to me, if something doesn't make sense or you can't, you can't make heads or tails of it, you know, investigate further. And so you know, you have one of those patients that, that, that they don't respond the way you think they need to respond and you're worried about it, make, definitely make a referral. So that's, that's, that's one. The other thing is that if you guys are familiar with the new periodontal classification, there is a, there is, I, in my opinion, there's a very, very clear demarcation of when referrals needed and when there isn't. As soon as you hit stage three, you have to make the referral. Mm -hmm. Stage one, you can probably manage it yourself. Stage two, you can probably be okay, but if they don't respond, that's when you should refer. Stage three and stage four, 100%, you need to make the referral right away. Um, then other things are, you know, mucogingival defects, uh, which I think are oftentimes overlooked. Definitely make that referral. And if, and if you have a patient that you're having a hard time sort of managing, maintaining, you feel like they're breaking down, then definitely, definitely make that referral as well. I think that's great that you have that whole because and then like I find that a lot of offices um, they're they have a fear of giving up their their patients like they yeah. want to try to keep it mm -hmm. to themselves so if mm -hmm. you can kind of come up with the with a protocol in your office that when we hit this let's make sure that we're you know taking yeah. it to the next level and we're going yeah. to refer out yeah. to the specialist yeah. And, and I think a lot of times some of my colleagues, they, they call perio the black hole of your patients. You, pay, you send the patient for a perio and then they're gone. And so that's, that's, that's concerning for me as a, because I don't want people to think of periodontists as this place where your patients go and they never come back. Um, for me, it's much more of a team approach, right? I always tell my patients, even if you come in to see me for your periodontal maintenance, you need to go to your dentist at least once a year. Uh, and you need to go back to who referred you at least once a year so that they can follow up with you as well. Because it's not just something that, um, you know, you, you come to me and then I take over. It's that's not it because I'm not your sole provider. I'm not your I'm not your general dentist. I'm your I'm just your periodontist. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. You're right. Is that there's that there's this, you know there is this need for a, a team approach of both the, the referral and, and the specialist. What is your feeling on patients going through ortho? I, mm -hmm. I have a strong belief that they really should have an evaluation done, but where do you sit on ortho patients and perio? Yeah, great. And you can, you can divide it into two, two groups, two populations, um, like adolescents and, and, and kids and adults. Um, adolescents and kids only if necessary, like let's say they have really, really thin biotype and you, know, you're, you need to do a lot of proclination and there's a lot of crowding. And so you're worried about creating mucogingival problems because most kids don't have periodontal issues. I'm generalizing, but most of them don't. Um, and then the second population is our adults. And I would say, you know, 100% 
definitely get a pre-orthodontic periodontal clearance for every single one of your adult ortho patients. Um, you know, I always tell patients who come to see me, sometimes they say, well, I, I, want, I just want to get my teeth straight. Why do I have to see the periodontist? And I always say, you know, you want to have beautiful straight teeth and I encourage it, but you got to make sure they're in a strong foundation. Because if you build a beautiful house on a shaky foundation, you can lose that beautiful house. You can have beautiful straight teeth, but then they're mobile, they're going to be uncomfortable and you don't want to lose teeth. And I, I hate to say it, I've seen a lot of cases where people finish their Invisalign treatment and they come back and they say, these teeth are mobile or I have pain here. And, and so I think it's a really good idea for um, before you start adult orthodontics, just to get the periodontal clearance. Um, and I work with a few really great dentists and lots of orthodontists who send me their adult patients. And I think it's a good, good rule of thumb to go by. I'm glad you brought up Invisalign because I think that that's sometimes because so much of that is done within a general practice that people forget that that's actually part of the orthodontic umbrella. You know, yeah. you just think of it as, as a, Oh, I'm just getting Invisalign. As, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm really glad that you specifically spoke to that. Yeah. And I, I want to clarify, you know, when I say refer to a periodontist prior to doing ortho, you don't necessarily have to do that, but, but you should do a periodontal, a comprehensive periodontal assessment. And if you can be comfortable that the patient has good bone, good tissues, uh, then you can go ahead and do the ortho. But if you're not comfortable making that determination, then refer it. But if you are, do your exam, make the, make the assessment, and then go ahead and proceed with the ortho. And then you need to assess when it's finished, because even if they do like mm -hmm. Invisalign, sometimes now they're on the verge of, you know, you can see that thinning tissue, you can feel, you know, mm -hmm. so maybe you need to do some proactive once again, um, you know, referrals yeah. so that you, you're protecting everything. Right. Yeah. So with my team that I work with, what we do is we do um, uh, a pre-orthodontic assessment and then we do during ortho. I see the patient's minimum one, uh, once or twice a year. And then we obviously we do a post orthodontic final assessment as well. Perfect. So what are some of your favorite surgeries or, you know, the, in your, in your wheelhouse that you just love to work on? Yeah, that's, I, I, you know, it's, I'm glad you brought it up. I put a couple of cases together that I can definitely show you guys. Um, generally speaking, um, I, I like procedures that have follow-up um, that are not just one and done. Um, some of my least favorite things to do uh, are the sort of the prescription crown lengthening, just crown lengthen this too, so I can get the crown on. I mean, it's, it's great. Uh, I can do it. It's, it's, it's fine, but um, I don't, I don't love it. The, the kind of stuff that I love to do is are things that you start with the patient and they have a problem and then you sort of build through the whole, the whole procedure. So I put a couple of cases together. I'm going to try to share my screen with you and uh, hopefully we can go through some of these things. And I'm happy to answer questions about it. If anybody and uh, one second here, let me just, let's see here. Okay. Can you guys see the slides? Let me just make sure to put it on presenter view. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. Awesome. So <clears throat> this is the first case that I have. I call it implant side development and basically a, a guided bone regeneration and horizontal ridge augmentation because this is one of those cases that, that starts off really, really simple and then it becomes really complex. And I, 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 I luckily, to, I documented the case through and through. So I wanted to sort of share that with you. This is a, a lovely patient of mine. She's a 28 year old female who unfortunately had a really serious trauma and she fell down and she hit her teeth on the stairs. And when you look at this photo, clinical photo, it, it actually looks pretty good. But what you, one thing you'll notice is on the radiograph, you see that horizontal line on that canine. I'm not sure if you guys can see that where that arrow is. Yes. And that's actually a horizontal fracture uh, of, of the canine. And unfortunately, it's a very, it's a very uh, serious injury and on, that canine needs to come out. Um, there's really not much we can do to save that too. So when you look at her clinically, everything looks okay, but in, in, under, actually underneath things are kind of um, in bad shape. And we took a CT scan and I want to show you the CT scan a couple of, you know, I, I highlighted a couple of things on the CT scan. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with reading CBCT. So I'm going to just go through this uh, in a little bit of uh, detail. So there's two different views. One is called the sagittal view, which is basically a cross section. And the other one is a coronal view, which is basically dead on and sort of like almost like a pan or a PA. But in the sagittal view, you can see on tooth number one and three, you see that horizontal line again, showed by that red arrow. 
that's where you have that horizontal fracture. And again, and you can see that it's extending into the pulp chamber. So she was obviously very symptomatic as well, almost like endodontic um, symptoms. And you can also see that there is a, uh, on the yellow arrow, there is an apical infection on tooth number one, two. Again, this is secondary to the trauma that she experienced. There's no fillings on that tooth. Everything is fine, but she had the trauma. The other thing you'll notice is that on the one, three and the one, two, so the buccal surface, which is the, to the left of the screen, there is no bone there's, or there's very little bone. There's actually no bone on the one, two and very little bone on the one, three. So her, her biotype was naturally very thin and she had very little bone. So this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of that. And basically the, what you can see from the front view and from the, the right buccal view is that there is, there is you, know, you can actually see the roots coming through the bone. So again, that's that thin biotype that we we're speaking of. And so this makes this case very challenging because we know the canine has to come out and, but she doesn't have a lot of bone. So what we had to do for her is they did a, if you look at this um, PA, you can actually, first of all, this is taken in January. The first x-ray that I showed you, I believe was in November of 2018. So only three months later, but within that three months on the measles of that canine, you can sort of see that black shadow. That's a vertical bone loss that has occurred very rapidly. And it's gone down to the level of where that fracture was. So this is why these kinds of, um, you know, vertical root fractures are, although this is a horizontal fracture, but root fractures can be so detrimental to a tooth. So there's very rapid bone loss. You'll notice that there's a palpectomy was done on the canine so that she could be out of pain and a root canal was done on the one two to address that, that apical infection. And we also splinted the teeth together. Uh, nothing fancy, just like a, and just a wire that was glued onto the buccal surface of the teeth so that she could be comfortable because she was experiencing some mobility. And so, yeah, that's where we did a palpectomy. And then there's that yellow line showing the vertical bone loss, right? So hopefully nobody's eating lunch. Uh, there's going to be some, there's going to be some, uh, some clinical photos. I should, probably should have warned people, but it's going to be a little bit gory. Um, but essentially what we've done here, we've, we've pushed, we've took the canine out, uh, which came out relatively easily. And we raised a flap and I'll just orient people. Can you see my cursor on the screen or no? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so where you see my cursor, this is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the gum tissue. And we ref, there's, a, there's been a in, releasing incision over here and another releasing incision over here, which allows us to basically reflect the, the gum all the way back. And so what you see here is all the bone. And you can see there's a little perforation in the bone there. And then the yellow line is sort of where the buccal plate is. And the green line is where the buckle plate should have been. Mm. And so what we did here is we put a, a, a barrier membrane. The membrane is basically just the way you think. It's like a blanket that covers your uh, eventual bone graft. And this is a resorbable membrane, meaning that it'll just your body will just dissolve it in a few, few weeks. And these two little screws are what we call tacks that are going to help um, uh, keep the membrane in place. And you, you kind of like making a sausage. Imagine like you have a casing and then you stuff some bone in there and then you wrap this, the casing really tight. And that's what really helps um, keep the bone graft in place. So what you'll see is that after we place the bone graft to build up the bone, I kind of wrap that membrane um, around the, the, the buckle onto the palate to just make it very, very tight. And then we, we cover it up with another non resolvable membrane and we close everything up. So it looks pretty good after you close it up. And then this is the x-ray before and after, right? So you can see that the canine is gone. Now on the um, PA on the right, you can see the, the crestal bone level is now straight. We've lost that vertical defect that was there and you can see the two tacks are replaced. Um, this tack looks like it's in the sinus, but it's not, I assure you, it just, it just kind of looks like it's in the sinus. But what's really nice is that this is the CT scan now after. I put the CT scan on the left from before. You can see where the canine used to be. There was very little buckle, buckle bone. But now if you can see how, how nice and wide the bone is here, we have a very, very nice wide <clears throat> um, patch of bone. And these two little white dots, those are the tacks that we had used to retain our membrane. So you can see now this is like in the cross section, we have a very wide band of bone, which can, which can be very... Um, stable for, for an implant. So then we re-entered the area, you can see before and after, right? So before is on the left, where you had this massive defect, and on the right, this is following the ridge augmentation, right? So we have a much, much wider band of bone, which then allows us to place the implant in an ideal position. And uh, 
So this is the kind of stuff that I really like. So when you start with a, with a case where, you know, it seems, seems like simple, um, everything looks good clinically, but then you open it up and you're like, holy Mac, like right? there's a huge defect that you have to then um, augment. And here's a case, we did a two year follow up on it. And so, you know, clinically she looks pretty good. Um, you know, the crown is a little bit shorter on the canine and I think the dentist did that on purpose so that there's less occlusal forces on it. Um, and, but you can see the implant is nice and stable. And, uh, you know, I think that was a really good clinical result basically from, from, from where she started to where she ended up considering how much work needed to be done. So that's I, the first case. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have maybe on, on this first case is, uh, yeah, for sure. Um, actually a, a good question just came in. Um, yeah. so Melanie was asking initially, was that yeah. lack of facial bone due to trauma or was she, was she always kind of a, a thinner biotype? Yeah, she was always a familiar biotype. Um, that kind of that. So if you notice, I'm gonna see if I can go back. If you look over here on the CBCT report, if you notice, this is no alveolar fracture evidence. So she didn't break that bone off. It was just the way that it was. She was born. Um, so she's just naturally a thin biotype, and she did not have orthodontic history. So it's not like these teeth were pushed into this position. This is just the way she naturally is. And you know, this is some some people are like that, and it's completely normal. I just want, could you please talk to us a bit about for those people who are unfamiliar mm -hmm. with uh, cone beam CT that, um, it, that we can, we have maybe in a general practice, someone referred out to check on if something's cracked and then mm -hmm. and a report may come back from a periodontist or an endodontist. Um, and, and as a clinician, maybe looking after that client, we may be able to see more things that we are unaware of on a uh, cone beam CT. And could mm -hmm. you just speak to that for us so that when reports come back, if we're in a general practice, you know, what can we learn if, if we then go and look at the report that comes back? Mm -hmm. um, what potentially could we see on there that we may be unaware of? Yeah, so I think a cone beam CT can be an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and I think it needs to be used uh, appropriately. Uh, there's two, there's two reasons why you would take a CT and it can tell you a lot of information. Um, I would not recommend just taking a CT because as a, as a fishing tool, say to see, Oh, what else could be here that I'm not seeing? Let's take a CT because I think the, uh, it's not following the, the alar, alar principle, which is as low as reasonably achievable for, um, uh, radiation exposure. Um, but the two con conditions that can be very, very helpful is, uh, um, if you want just to try to figure out what kind of bone you have and how much volume you have. And number two is to follow, find out pathology. So let's say you have, um, you know, a vertical root fracture, a tooth that had endodontic treatment, but it's still symptomatic. Um, something that your two dimensional plane films, panoramic and PAs or bite wings are not able to ascertain or give you enough in information. Then I think it's a wonderful idea to get CT scan. And, and then the diagnostic reports that are provided by the radiologist can be very, very helpful in, uh, in, in trying to help you figure out things that you, you, you were unaware of or needed more information on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just trying to share that, that mm -hmm. from time to time when I've had one of my clients go for a cone beam CT regarding mm -hmm. vertical root fracture, that mm -hmm. I've been able to see other areas that right. um, where there's you know, perhaps a bone, bone defect right. or a better picture periodontally yeah. of my yeah. client that I wouldn't have otherwise had other than yeah. for this particular issue, yeah. I, I all of a sudden gained some more knowledge. Yeah, and yeah, that's great. And, and you just look at this case right here. I did, I, you know, I'm a guy, you brought it up, but if you look at the one seven, look yeah. at the bone loss on the one seven, right? We, we sent this patient for a CT scan on the canine but then we saw the bone loss on the one seven. So, you know, you are absolutely right. You can often sometimes find out um, a lot of information that you, you know, you otherwise didn't know about um, with the CT scan. So yeah, you're right. Thank you. How do you address that with your, like, how do you, when you know you have something specific that you're working on, but then you see this mm -hmm. issue, how do you deal with that? You know, I think people are generally speaking, uh, they, they want to know what's going on in their mouth. And so, you know, I run into this situation, not just with CT scans, but I run into a situation where um, patients are referred for a, a specific problem. Um, let's say soft tissue graft at one three, but then I notice that they have a periodontal defect on the one five or something like that. And so 
usually what I say is um, to the patient is that, you know, Mrs. Jones, um, you were sent to me for problem X, but while I was doing the examination, I, I, you know, I think there was something else going on on this other tooth as well. Um, so, you know, let me get in touch with your referring dentist uh, and to see if they, you know, what, what, what kind of plan they already have in place for this. And if not, let's come up with a plan together. And so usually I tell the patient that, you know, there's something else going on, um, but it's probably something that your dentist already knows about and they have a plan about. And let me just, let me just communicate with them and let's, and if there isn't a plan, let's come up with a plan together. Um, so I think patients generally are receptive to the idea of getting, finding out what's wrong, if there's other things that are wrong. Um, but I think the delicate balance is making sure that you don't alienate the, the, the referring dentist or, or make him feel like something has been missed kind of thing. I think you're very eloquent in how you phrase that because I do feel like sometimes people are scared to refer because I don't think mm -hmm. they feel like they might get thrown under the bus or the right. patient hasn't, maybe the patient hasn't accepted care for 20 years and now they came in and like, hey, I need to do this now. Right. And right. you don't have that necessarily that full backstory. So how you, yeah. uh, you know, phrase that really makes us feel better because we do the best we can and we're trying to, you know, manage that. So thank you. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I really truly believe that every, you know, most healthcare prof pro professionals have the, the patient's best interest in mind. And, and, and it's important to realize that you're part of the patient's team and that, you know, you're not just some, some guy who, who knows everything and has all the answers. You, I, I, I know I don't. And so, and uh, yeah, you, I, I try to be very, not to be diplomatic, but I try to, you know, always work with, uh, with, with my team and to make sure that we take care of the patient the best we can. Mm -hmm. Um, see, Avash, I had a question yeah, come in. Um, so if a hygienist has ref uh, or a dental office has referred to you and this type mm -hmm. of procedure has been done, mm -hmm. are there any home care recommendations that you would recommend to us as dental hygienists to partner with our clients for? For this, for this case specifically? Yes. Yeah. So um, the, the home care varies uh, based on the different stages of the treatment. Um, so for instance, after the, the ridge augmentation, the, the horizontal bone grafting, the patient actually has to abstain from any kind of hygiene from the area for approximately two weeks um, completely. Uh, no, no brushing, no flossing, no water picks, uh, nothing. Um, all they get is a, a, a chlorhexidine rinse um, and, or salt water. And then what happens after two weeks when stitches come out they get a post-surgical toothbrush that they're allowed to use to brush the adjacent teeth with very gently. Um, and this is for approximately another two weeks. And then usually what I do in my office um, and or the referring dentist, uh, the referring office is that we bring the patient back after about six weeks following the ridge augmentation and they have a one unit. In our office, we call it a post-surgical sanitary visit. And essentially is a, 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 a one unit appointment where the patient gets super gingival plaque control because this is one, an area where we told them not to brush and then we gave them a, a very soft bristle toothbrush that, and so invariably there's going to be things that are that are there and so um, that's what we bring in for that post surgical stand of the visit is a one unit appointment and uh, you know we do a follow up for them as well after that point it's normal um, home care and professional care. So you can do subgenital scaling, you can do, you know, flossing, regular brushing, electric brush, um, you know, uh, manual brush, whatever, you, just, you know, that they were using before. And so they just go back to normal. So uh, for this kind of, and then after the implant, it's, uh, you know, the implant protocol, C-shaped flossing. Uh, in this case, I would use a, introduce a Proxa brush. Um, I definitely recommend it again. Uh, for me, my personal preference is always an electric toothbrush. Um, and, you know, going from there. Perfect. Um, and then you had mentioned putting the, the wire on there just because of the mobility that that client That's was right. experiencing. That's right. Um, would it be the general dentist? Would you refer back to the general dentist or do you actually place those in your practice? For me, I, I can do both. Um, even though I practice for a short time as a general dentist, I am at first a general dentist and a specialist. So I have a dual license. So technically I could do it. I just choose not to because I'm a firm believer of do what you're good at. And uh, maybe the reason I'm not a, I'm very honest because I wasn't a phenomenal general dentist. So I refer out for that personally, but I can do it. If, if, if need, if, you know, push comes to shove, I mean, no problem. I can, I can bond the wire onto it. It's not a, it's not the end of the world. So, but no, typically, again, this is something I collaborate with my referring team and I let them take care of the restorative components of it. And then I will just do the surgical parts. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Okay, that's all we've got as far as questions go for that case. That was, I think, all the questions we had. Perfect. Um, so the second case, similar story, uh, but slightly different sort of background. This is one of a, we call it a quote unquote vertical ridge augmentation because the person doesn't have enough vertical bone. And again, it's another implant side development, but this is an interesting case because this is a patient that came in is a little bit older uh, male patient. And you can see that this is a tooth that has significant attachment loss. And you can see on the PA that there's quite a bit of uh, radiographic bone loss. There is a me mesial vertical defect on the 2.6. And uh, there is a through and through frication uh, from, from the mesial to the buckle. Now the distal bone is excellent, but unfortunately mesial bone is not very good. Um, and the tooth is slightly mobile. And the problem that the patient has is that there's a bit of proximity to the sinus floor. If you can see my cursor, this white line is the left maxillary sinus. So anything above my cursor is air and anything below my cursor is bone, uh, except where there's been bone loss. So this is a case where we had to make a decision with the patient. So the question is, do we try to save this tooth through periodontal surgery? And in which case you have the choice of either doing what's called resective surgery, which is pocket reduction surgery, which is you flap it open, you remove the extra gum, and you basically put the gum tissue on the mesial kind of close to where the bone is, and then you flatten out the bone here. That leads to a lot of problems. Aesthetically, that's a very un unesthetic outcome. And it doesn't necessarily improve the prognosis of the tooth very much because you still have the frication involvement. So then the second option is, okay, you try to save the tooth through periodontal treatment, you can do regeneration where you try to grow the bone back to, you know, and regenerate this frication bone loss. But, you know, the periodontal literature is very clear that, a, that an F3 frication in the maxillary molar is very difficult to regenerate. So the prognosis for that is very, very low. So we decided that throughout the different options with the patient, the decision was made to take the tooth out because saving it um, had a fairly either very bad aesthetic or and a long poor long-term outcome through regeneration. And so the reason why I wanted to show this case is because this is one of those cases where we use something called PRF and sticky bone. And this is something that a lot of people are talking about. Um, and basically what it is, you take the patient's blood and you spin it down in a centrifuge and you get two different um, fractions that, uh, and you get it, you get something that's, um, this sort of gelatinous, it's basically fibrin that's in the patient's blood. And this, this fibrin is, um, mixed with a lot of platelets and a lot of white blood cells. And then you get this sort of snot looking clot, and then you just squish it with a, with a weight and you get this flat membrane. And this is a very, very helpful, um, it's basically full of white blood cells and plate cells that are platelets that are going to promote healing and help disinfect the wound. And then the other thing that you can do is that you can take some of that blood um, and you can actually add it to your bone graft. So you can see on the, on the far left, we have particular bone graft and then you add some of it to it and you can see it starts to thicken up and then eventually it turns into this massive sort of like almost like a putty. And you can imagine this is so much easier to handle um, than just a particulate. So you have a putty versus sand. And so if I have to mold something and I have to graft something, uh, putty is a lot easier to handle than, than sand. And so what we did for this gentleman is that we took the tooth out and we used that putty to regrow the bone. And so you, what you can see here is that now the bone is nice and flat. We don't have that vertical defect anymore that we had on that six. So we have like a nice flat crest of bone. But unfortunately for him is that his sinus is still pretty close. Um, and so what we have to do, we want to place an implant here. We have to place the implant into the sinus. And so he's going to need what's called an indirect sinus lift. And not to get too technical about it, he only has about seven millimeters. And so what we need to do is we need to bump the floor of the sinus up. So the sinus, if you look at on this image on the left, is basically an air-filled cavity. And this air-filled cavity is lined by a membrane. And that, that there's a little purple line that shows there. And what's, what's important is that you want to lift that membrane, add your bone under it without perforating it. And so what you do is that you, you, you know, you use some drills to make an osteotomy in the, in the, in where the implant's going to go. And you very gently lift that membrane. And you can see here, uh, you can see my osteotomy on the, on, on the, on the PA. And you'll notice that the continuation of that, that white line is now gone. That's because I've, you can tell that I've broken through the sinus floor. And the reason why I know I haven't perforated is because when I add my bone graft, I can see a perfect balloon of bone. If you perforate that membrane, the bone graft is just going to go flying everywhere. And so you don't get that little perfect ball of bone. 
And so then what you do is you just place your implant. And then your implant is going to be surrounded by beautiful bone all the way around. So that's sort of a, that's a really interesting case because it required two different kinds of bone grafting. One was at the time of the extraction where we needed to do some, um, you know, re regenerate that vertical bone loss. And then we still didn't have enough. And at the time of the implant placement, we needed to add a little bit of bone into the sinus, which made it a little bit more, uh, more interesting. So I think that's the, yeah, that was the second case that I that I wanted to share with you guys. So I, I like that case because again, it's not just a straightforward, you know, crown length in this tooth. It's, you know, you have a tooth that has a, a fairly severe defect and you have to decide what are you gonna do? Are you gonna save it or are you gonna take it out? And if you're gonna take it out, you know, you have to know, you have to, you know, build up the bone and then you have to be able to prepare to get into the sinus and then you can place the implant. So sort of an interesting case that I wanted to show you with you because it had multiple components to it. Yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> it's like that's like next level CSI type of uh, I mean, you just created bone so I don't know um, how how much like as far as your clients go yeah how much do they want to know like I mean as a, as a hygienist I'm glued to the screen here but how yeah. much do they want to know you know I, for me I found that there's two populations one who want to know nothing and then the most people who want to know a lot um, and I think knowledge is power for most people. So long as you don't gross them out and freak them out, I think it's all about delivery. Um, I think it's uh, people want to know more. And, and I think if you, if you talk to them with somewhat with confidence and with reassurance that this is something that is done frequently, that is done uh, with usually with not a lot of complications that they're okay with it. And also what I, what I do is that my consults are, are at least, um, 45 minutes to an hour. And I always joke with my patients, I always try to talk them out of whatever procedure I'm trying to tell them to do until they say, no, I want to do it. Because I don't want to feel like I'm forcing anybody to do anything that they're not comfortable with. I just tell them, here are your options, here are what we can do. And, and, I, and I just kind of go through the risks, the benefits, the costs, and the alternatives of every single option. And then usually most patients are quite... Um, receptive to the treatment plan that, that we give them because they, they, they truly feel like that's their best option and that they know what's, what's involved and what are the risks and what are the benefits. Yvesh, there were a few questions that came in with regards to this. So mm -hmm. if a patient didn't want to go ahead and get the implant, would mm -hmm. you still recommend the sinus lift? Oh, absolutely not. Never ever do a sinus lift without an implant. A sinus lift is, is, a, is, an, is a bone grafting procedure that augments the vertical height that's available in the maxilla prior to implant surgery. Um, so yes, nowadays uh, only a sinus lift when, it, when an implant is planned. Okay. There's quite a few, um, let me, why don't we do a couple more questions for this one and then what I'll do is, because it's, it's sparked quite a bit of interest. Um, maybe we'll go through a couple other cases and then if we have sure. time at the end, I might bring you back to this case. Yeah, of course. Um, but just out of curiosity, someone was asking why the 2.8 yeah. would not be extracted. Yeah, so uh, what I didn't show you guys in this case is that the, uh, the 2.8 was, uh, was, was bony impacted and it was actually not, so there's no soft tissue. So the 2.8 is not in the oral cavity. It is a bony impacted tooth. The patient is about 60 years old. So putting him through the, the, the recovery of, a, of, a, of an extraction may not be necessary if there's no clinical indication. On the CT scan, um, there is actually quite a bit of space between the 2.8 and the implant. I know on this PA, it kind of looks like that 2.8 and that implant are almost touching. They're nowhere near each other. It's just a curvature of the mouth and the angulation of the PA. So the 2.8 is sort of out of the operatory site. It's asymptomatic. It's fully bony impacted. We, we discussed it with the patient. The patient said, you know what, let's just leave it. I agreed with him. And so we didn't extract it. Okay. That's a good explanation. Mm -hmm. And maybe just one more for this case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, is, does it often happen where the sinus is perforated? Like, is that mm, a high yeah. risk? Yeah, absolutely. So sinus perforations happen about 25% of the time, according to the literature. Um, so it's not a, it's not an uncommon uh, problem question is, can you manage the sinus perforation? And I think for the intent of this uh, discussion, I think that's beyond what's intended here. But yeah, they actually do happen. And I think there's about 25% risk that the sinus membrane will be perforated. Okay. And the bigger the sinus lift, the more risk of perforation. So 
Um, for a technique like this, I would not try to raise the bone more than five millimeters. Let's just put it that way. So if you have, if you need more than five millimeters, you should not be doing it in this technique. You should use an alternate technique, which is called a lateral sinus lift, which is going through the outside. Okay. Yeah. Um, because it has a good case of um, compromised bone on the mm -hmm. distal of five, could you just run us through a, a mm -hmm. slight conversation on the one tooth problem versus the three tooth problem. If our client is looking at a bridge for insurance purposes, let's say. Yeah, for sure. So here's here's how I look at this tooth, right? So we have we have we have two options here, right? Um, we have the option of uh, let me go back to this PA because it because it's a preoperative PA, right? So now we took so because of the because of the vertical bone loss that was happening on the mesial of the six, the bone on the distal of the five was also compromised, right? Um, luckily for this patient, he has excellent bone on the mesial and he has good bone on the buccal and the palatal. So basically three quarters of that tooth on the five has really good bone around it. So there's no mobility. The other thing that you'll notice is that the soft tissue, I'm not sure if you can see it, the soft tissue is right here. So the periodontal pocket, there is no pocket either. He just has recession on the distal of the five. So that tooth is a relatively stable tooth. Um, so if he didn't want to do an implant, he could do a bridge. I would still caution against the bridge because that tooth is a bit of a compromise um, bone levels on that, uh, on that premolar. Um, so my preference would be to do an implant because then the five, the six, and the seven are three individual teeth. So if anything happens to the five, it doesn't affect the bridge. Um, whereas if you do a bridge, now you're married to that five and you got to last, it's got to last you a long time. So um, the patient was given the option of a bridge and he opted to go for an implant with the sinus lift. Um, but that's a great question. This tooth has compromised bone, but it's not periodontally compromised because there's no active periodontal disease because there's no pockets. Very good. Okay. So I think I'm just going to do, I have, I have two more kids, but I'm actually going to do one case here because um, this is a really good case because, which, which tells you how you can have two different mucogingival defects. And in my, my opinion, there's two major kinds of mucogingival defects um, where one, you have gingival recession and another one where you have very thin tissues. And this is, a, this is an adult patient who was, un, who was about to undergo orthodontic treatment through Invisalign. The orthodontist sent the patient to me for some pre-orthodontic periodontal clearance. And what we, what we noticed is that the patient has some recession on the centrals and the, the, the canine, you know, this is actually the, the, the two, three, it's been put into the lateral position. Um, and also the patient has very, very thin tissue down here. You can notice, notice that the patient had lots of recession on the premolars on both the right and the left and also in the maxillary. Um, but based on the orthodontics clin check, those teeth were not really going to move very much. So, and if you, the, other, the other thing you'll notice is that the mucogenital junction on the maxilla, I haven't drawn it here, but it's way up here. So the patient has lots of good attached gingiva on the buccal. And also on these teeth down here, they've had a previous soft tissue graft done where you have lots of good attached gingiva as well. So these teeth, one, they're not really moving that much. Two, they have really good attached gingiva. So even though they have recession, they didn't, we felt like they didn't need pre-orthodontic soft tissue grafting. The centrals and the canine, she didn't like the way it looked. She had a relatively high spine line. She was un not happy with the aesthetics. So we wanted to graft those areas from an aesthetic point of view. And also the, the three, one, and four, one, you can see how the mucogingival junction comes up. So now these two have very, very thin tissue. And unfortunately, these teeth were going to get proclined. And so the orthodontist and I decided that we we're going to do some soft tissue grafting ahead of time. So I'm going to show you a case here before and after. So this is the, we grafted from the, the right central to the um, right, um, sorry, the left first premolar. So this is a connective tissue graft. So there is a graft that's been placed underneath here. And then following the graft, that's what it looked like. So this is now the canine. Um, you'll notice that the papilla here was a little bit blunted, but this has only been after about a month. So this papilla will eventually reform. I just don't have a long enough follow-up. And you notice that there's some orthodontic attachments now on this, right? So the patient has now started ortho. So we did the grafting first and then the ortho started. And then this is a, this is a slightly different graft on the bottom where we did a free gingival graft. And you can just highlight the difference between the two procedures, right? The first one, everything was underneath. Uh, was kind of all uh, closed up nicely, whereas this one is more of an exposed kind of graph. And you notice we didn't put it at the level of the gingival margin. We put it at the level of the mucogingival junction. And so when it heals, it heals like that. So now these teeth have really, really nice 
wide band of attached gingerbread, they can procline them for forever. Um, and so that's sort of the difference between the, I just, I just like this case because it's one patient, two grafts um, for two different reasons. And I think that highlights it really, really well. And I encourage all of you when you see your, uh, your clients to, to look for recession defects and to look for um, minimally attached gingiva to see if there's any reason why they might need some treatment. For me, the recession defects, the, the, the three reasons you would do anything is aesthetics. They don't like the way it looks. If they have sensitivity um, to hot, cold, sweet touch, and or you're noticing that the recession is progressive. Um, and then for the, for the minimally attached gingiva, really it's concerned if you're planning on any kind of dentistry, orthodontics, crowns, bridges, fillings. If you're doing that, then it's, uh, it's a good idea to try to augment the tissue. And I just wanna point out that for these kinds of patients, I always recommend that after we do any kind of grafting, they go into some sort of an electric toothbrush because trauma from brushing is a huge, no, it's not a huge factor, but it's a very, it's a, definitely a big factor for causing um, progressive recession on these kinds of cases. And after we, you know, after we go from, we go from pre-op to post-op, I don't want them to brush away the gums um, and, and recreate the recession. So anyway, just wanted to kind of uh, leave you with that case as well. Have you tried the, um, the Oral-B IO? Oh, mm. Mm -hmm. I have, I have, and I have to say, I, I, I quite love the toothbrush. Um, and I'm not just saying that because uh, Crescent will be our, our sponsors, but <laughs> I do, I do, I have tried, um, I have tried the Philips Sonicare. I had the old Oral B Genius and I have tried the new IO and both my wife and I use the new IO. And we, I, I, I have to say it's probably my favorite electric toothbrush that I've tried to date. Um, it's a, it's a great brush. In situations like this, the IO mm -hmm. makes sense because it's got the optimal pressure. So you've got your green light, oh, yeah. you've got your, you know, your, your zones. And I think yeah. that this really is a great tool because they want to make sure it's preserved. They don't want to have problems. They don't want to have to come back for this. No, no, absolutely. I think that that is a huge asset because I think for me, speaking from general practice for a few, just a few years, um, that we aren't sure sometimes what to recommend post graft and it's mm -hmm. like, you know, can they only use a manual brush? And then we hear, well, conflicting information, but now with yeah. this new evidence, particularly with that IO brush, I, I feel very confident having patients use it right after. Yeah. And I think there was a systematic review that was done that showed an electric toothbrush preserves the gingival margin um, following a soft tissue graft better than a manual toothbrush. So I have absolutely no, uh, no hesitation recommending an electric toothbrush. In fact, I tell them, you just spend X amount of money on these graphs, invest in an electric toothbrush to make sure you can maintain it. So unless they have a really good reason why they don't want to use an electric toothbrush, I just say that, you know what, it takes a technique out of your hands. Like you, like you said, you, you, you can't brush too hard. I mean, you certainly can, but you have a lot of auditory and visual signals telling you that you're brushing too hard. Um, so I, I think it's a brilliant idea to, to, to use an electric toothbrush following. And I would following think, it. yeah, I, I would think having the round head would be better for this situation as well, instead of like a rectangular head. So I think, yeah, have uh, absolutely. And it fits the tooth. You know what I mean? Like it, it kind of curves, it hugs the tooth, you know, you can kind of get the distal line angle, the mid facial, and then the mesial line angle. It, it's, it's very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do like that round head as well. Mm -hmm. Can you just repeat the criteria for uh, referral? I think the question was, let me just double check it here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Repeat the criteria for tissue graft. Yeah. So for my, so this is, this is my, my system. And I mean, I don't know if it's published anywhere, uh, but for me, really there's, there's three components for any kind of soft tissue grafting. Number one is aesthetics, right? If you don't like the way it looks, we should graft it to try to get some root coverage. Um, root coverage isn't always possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but, and also dealing with black triangles is exceedingly difficult, but generally speaking, aesthetics, if you don't like the way it looks, get a consult, we might be able to do something about it. Number two is sensitivity. Now, sensitivity is dental hypersensitivity due to root exposure. It's not sensitivity because you have a cavity or a root canal problem. This is sort of that, you know, you touch it with an explorer and they go like, because, or they have some ice, uh, ice water or hot coffee and they have that, you know, one second uh, pain. And when it comes to that, I tell them you have three options, really. Number one is use topical desensitizers, right? You can do a fluoride varnish or even better yet, use the sensitivity toothpaste. And again, like the Crest has the, uh, the gum sensitivity, which is a really great uh, toothpaste for that. Um, 
And then number th you can do a you can do a white filling as well. I usually encourage people not to do composite resin class fives because um, I say the filling is meant to be on a root uh, on a tooth, not a root, right? So fillings work well on enamel and dentin. They don't work so well on cementum. Mm -hmm. And often I've seen so many cases where there's a little bit of flash on the buccal margin, and that causes irritation and inflammation, which then causes more recession. So I'm sure you have lots of patients that have class five fillings that are two millimeters above the gingival margin. But I guarantee you when that filling was placed, it was at the gingival margin. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't like class five restorations. And then the third option is to soft tissue graft. And if you graft and get root coverage, you'll get, let's say you had 100% sensitivity and you got 80% root coverage, then you're gonna have 20% sensitivity, right? Because it's proportional to how much root coverage you get. So, so aesthetics is number one, sensitivity is number two, and then longevity is number three. And what I mean by longevity is what's the risk of the recession getting worse with time, mm -hmm. right? If you have, if you have existing recession on very thin tissue, that's a recipe for more recession. So, uh, you know, if you minimally attach gingiva and gingival recession together, you should graft it. If you only have minimally attached gingiva, then your question should be, what's the risk of this getting worse? And what are the factors that can make it worse? So those things include orthodontic treatments. Mm -hmm. If you're planning on dentistry, that's going to have a, that's going to have a, a margin close to the gingival margin. So a class five filling, uh, a, a crown, a bridge, um, or if the patient has a hard time keeping it clean because the tissue is just so sensitive because it's so thin that they, they, they you know, I, I don't brush my front lower teeth because it hurts so much. Then you should thicken the tissue so that the patient feels empowered to go ahead and, and, and clean it. So aesthetic sensitivity, longevity, those are the three reasons that you should do anything about mucogingival defects. Wow, this has been really so much knowledge. Thank you. Okay, yeah. You're welcome. Excellent. Yeah, I think we're going to need a part two. That's, that's the, uh... <laughs> yeah. love to have you back one day because it's. Yeah, for sure. Be, hey, listen, I, like I said, I love doing this stuff, so. Perfect. Well, I'm, I know you had we've got about five minutes left. I know you had the one last case. What, um, should we quickly go over the, the yeah. final case? Yes. Yeah. So, and yeah, sure. I, I know. And it, it, this is just another graph. I mean, I just, I'm just going to show this. This is, this is a, a case where we did the soft tissue graph and I took, put this photo because I wanted to dispel the myth of the palatal graph. Like everyone's like, ah, don't go to the periodontist. They're butchers. They're going to kill you. You're going to whatever. <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I deal with it every single day that they say, oh, I read from online or my dentist told me, uh, that it's going to be the, you know, you're going to have a really bad pizza burn for a week and it's the worst thing ever, but it's worth it. Like, I, I don't know. So, uh, first of all, this is what the, this is what the wound on the Lutheran path roof of the mouth looks like. There's two parallel incisions mm -hmm. and you take out the tissue in between. So this is the outside of the palate. And you can see my, this is my scalpel. I'm taking out this, the part in the middle and I suture this to this. So like the, it gets completely closed up. So you just take out the tissue in the middle. Now this is for a connective tissue graft. The free general graft is different. But when the patient leaves, they leave like this on the far right. And so for me, they get five layers. They get stitches, glue, sponge, wax, and a, and a, and a co-pack okay, or a stent. So by the time that they leave, the roof of the mouth is completely covered. And when I was in my residency, I used to do grafts and I used to just put some stitches in and be like, okay, see you in two weeks. And they'd come back and they say, I'm never going to do that again. Mm -hmm. And that's not a practice builder when you do a lot of grafts. And so when you protect the graft, when you protect the palate, I mean, it really, it's not that bad. And for me, my preference is to always use palatal tissue because this is the kind of, this is the kind of results that I typically get, mm -hmm. right? You get a really beautiful result. It's stable. You don't have to worry about using donor tissue. Mm -hmm. Donor tissue works. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say don't use uh, alloderm or allograft or whatever. But when it goes south, I'm not sure if any of you guys have seen an allograft fail, but it's nasty. Like it's basically gangrene. It's like necrotic tissue. So um, when, my, when my soft tissue grafts fail, I'm not perfect. My, my, my palatal grafts fail too, but they don't look like the alloderm. And for me, it's always about minim minimizing your, your risks and making sure that you do things that are predictable. So 99 out of 100 cases that I do is palatal. And I tell the patients, you know what? It's really not as bad as you think because if you do it right and you protect it right, it actually doesn't hurt that much. I've had patients come back for like six grafts and um, because you know we're, we can protect it. So anyway, I just wanted to put that up there just to say 
holographs are not as bad as they seem. Well, the people have spoken and part <laughs> two is wanted. So um, yeah, I think, no I think yes, uh, one day we, we need to, uh, we need to organize that in the, maybe in the new year at some point, but um, thank you so much. Back. Yeah, of course. Yes. Of course, it was lots of fun. This was very informative. Easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was so informative, honestly, and I really love the fact that you brought these cases because we refer out to you or to specialists around you. And sometimes we don't get to understand all the steps between. And mm -hmm. it's been a long time since I, you know, have attended such a great lecture. And this is a mini lecture. I'd love to attend one of your lectures, but you know how you walked us through it. So um, it was just, it was amazing. So thank you. Thank you, you very much. Me I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I'll it goes a long way when we're trying to convince our clients to, um, you know, forge forward and, and uh, invest. And, um, and then we, you know, education, as you said, is key. And uh, if we can uh, create expectations and make them feel at ease and explain things well enough, then that goes a long way to helping you, obviously, um, when they end up on, on uh, your front door. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for putting all this together. The pictures are fantastic. Great. Thank you so and much. I appreciate it. It's been amazing as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for this once again, um, for taking the time to do this. And uh, just thank you for being such a strong supporter of our dental hygiene community. It really means a lot to have um, someone in your position just respect us so well, so much and involve us so well in, in what you do. So, so thank you very, very much for this. Yeah, I, I honestly believe that the, the dentist hygienist relationship is probably the most important in dentistry. And, uh, and I think we just have to feed it and, and encourage it and support it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Um, please stay tuned for our next uh, show, which is coming up on January the 8th, 2021. Um, and we will be talking with uh, hygienist Michelle Hudson and um, Anna Rice. And their topic is in our hearts and minds, heart health, brain health, and oral systemic health. So it'll be a good segue to um, really uh, kickstart your practice that way. So please mark it on your calendars for January the 8th. That's perfect. Thank you. And for our Ontario dental hygienists who want to join us this weekend for the quality assurance workshop, I uh, would still have some spaces available. If you uh, would like to join Beth and I, it starts tomorrow, uh, nine to 12 Saturday, nine to 12 Sunday, and then a one hour Q and A um, with Beth and I. Um, and then again, with the process of care that Beth and Carrie are presenting together, they started it last week. And uh, so part two starts on Tuesday. So if you did, it's not too late to uh, join them as well. Um, and then that's it for us for the year. It's been a wonderful year in a, some ways and not so wonderful other ways, but um, thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us. And, it was my uh, pleasure. I really, yeah, I really appreciate it. We hope to see you again. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Okay, bye. Bye, bye. 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 bye.